Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us for our uh, final in our summer career talk series around um, careers and opportunities in STEM and research. Uh, this session and series has been hosted by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. My name is Dr. Faith Dukes. I'm the K-12 uh, director of K-12 STEM programs here at the lab. Uh, as we have gone through the last four weeks, we have talked about making the most of your summer opportunity, the future of food and farming, and the importance of data science. And today we will be talking about new materials on the frontier. And so um, with that being said, we have two wonderful panelists who are going to talk about how do ideas come from the laboratory into our hands? How do we make and synthesize new materials and how might they go out to the general population? And so we're happy that you all decided to join us today. Um, so we really appreciate you being here and being a part of this session. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions at all in our chat box and we'll try to get them in within this hour. Um, you've just seen that our um, recordings are on our STEM Career Talks page on the K-12 website and that has been posted in our chat box there. So if you missed any of the sessions um, earlier this month, please do check those out. They were all great discussions. Um, without uh, taking too long, I want to get to our first speaker. He is Dr. Bis Bezad Rad um, from the Molecular Foundry here at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So Dr. Rad, I'd like you to turn on your video um, and I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can share and begin an introduction about yourself and the work you do here at Berkeley Lab. Um. My name is Bezad Rad. I work at the Molecular Foundry and I'm here to talk about uh, kind of my career and what we do um, or what I do at the Foundry to study biological materials. Um, so um, I work in this uh, fabulous building uh, that I'm showing here in the title slide that overlooks the bay. Um, it's kind of great. I wish you guys could come visit. Um, we regularly host tours and show people around um, and offer a lot of neat signs for everybody to see. So um, I actually kind of more of a California kid. I grew up in um, Southern California uh, near near Los Angeles um, where it was really hot inside the valley. So I took up things like swimming. Um, this is Mark Spitz, uh, you know, where he uh, was a gold medalist until, you know, a lot of more people came and made, made a lot more gold medals. Met him actually once when I was on the swim team. But, you know, growing up in the valley, I was kind of like, you know, this is very kind of sub suburbs and, you know, visiting, kind of talking to, hang out with friends and just going to school, but one of the things that really stood out um, when I was going through high school was uh, a small article that appeared always in the Los Angeles Times uh, called Mind Over Matter. And it was by this uh, local author, Casey Cole, who really took the time to interview and talk to a bunch of scientists in, around the world, really from like Richard Feynman to um, Teller and these other physicists. And she wrote about that and she wrote about all these really complicated things in a very, very some short kind of article that appeared um, inside the newspaper every week. Um, this is her book that she eventually published of all those articles, but it was very influential to me uh, during my youth because it was just astounding to read about all these wonderful uh, scientific discoveries or theories and, and, and just really complicated things that people, you know, don't really understand as much, but then kind of get it distilled into like a very few sentences. So things like complex numbers or things like, you know, uh, life under the ocean to, you know, stars in the sky. So it was very influential as a science for me to become a scientist, um, you know, it's such a small thing, but very profound. And eventually I kind of uh, meandered through um, the UC system where I started off as an undergrad at Cal um, studying biochemistry. I was really fascinated by a lot of biological systems and, and cells and life by itself. And that's where I kind of started looking at all these things. I did internships uh, with a professor, uh, Bob Glazer, uh, learning about proteins and how they work and how light they convert light into energy, which was really fascinating to me, um, how those function in bacteria. I then found myself uh, going to UC Davis for graduate school. Um, there I continued my work doing more work on proteins, but really kind of using different techniques like microscopy um, and other kind of um, fast rapid biophysical techniques that use like light um, and uh, other, I uh, use light to really probe kind of their interactions and how proteins function and how they function together, which was really interesting to me. Um, and eventually I found myself at uh, 
Berkeley lab, um, both as a postdoc and now as a staff member at the Molecular Foundry. And what I do at the Molecular Foundry, what the Molecular Foundry does in general is that we're a nanoscale science research center, we're an NSRC, we're a DOE found, uh, funded facility. Um, there's five such NSRCs that are sprinkled throughout the country. Um, we're shown in the top right here, uh, top left here is a map of America, and you can see kind of where the different facilities lie. They're kind of all over the country so people can access them. We offer a knowledge-based expertise in, in assembly and analysis of nanoscale materials. And so what's a nanoscale? Nanoscale is one one thousandth of a millimeter, right? So that's a well, hundred times smaller than like the width of your hair. So we're really good at actually taking really, really small things um, like atoms or proteins or molecules and really bringing them together um, at that assembly scale to make new materials and to be able to characterize those materials. And what our facilities are actually free. We offer them to national labs, we offer them to universities, startups and companies, and all these different people come here to learn and to understand their materials or develop new ones and then kind of go off and, you know, bring them out to the world and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, make, make their life better. Um, specifically, you know, what I do at the Molecular Foundry is I'm actually really focused on biological materials. And biological materials kind of sounds as it is, is that it's a material that's made from biological you know, molecules. And so when you think of biology or you think of a cell, typically you think of maybe three things, proteins, DNA, maybe lipids as the membrane. Um, but I specifically work with maybe proteins. So I mentioned my graduate work through my undergraduate work because there's such a kind of like rich and sort of robust system that the cell uses to make so many different structures. And so they can be a really good um, starting material to make very complicated and very um, complex materials overall. And one particular material that I'm that we're fascinated with for over probably 10 years now are these surface layer proteins that I'm showing here on the left side. Um, this is a bacteria cell that's in, in, um, imaged at very high resolution, so down to maybe a few nanometers. And the first thing you know, anybody who took this image notice, uh, noticed, and you should notice, is that there's like this regular repeating kind of square dotted pattern on this, on this cell. And Actually, if you take many bacteria cells, these are anything that grows in the dirt, things that grow in water, and you take a similar image, you'll actually see these different repeating patterns over and over again and completely encompassing the cell. And that's because they actually make this protein armor. And this protein armor called a surface layer protein is actually a single protein that just repeats itself over and over again, all around the cell, kind of making a, a sort of chain mail armor um, for the cell. And it kind of um, as a result, you know, um, envelops the cell and offers a layer of protection. <clears throat> and they come in different um, kind of symmetries. So the one on the left here was a square symmetric. But in, in nature, we've observed several of these different symmetries. So they're either what's called oblique or P2 or P3. And the symmetries refer to how many times you could turn the protein or turn this sort of pattern um, and get the original pattern. And so it's a nice little tie-in. Um, to sort of symmetry groups and like mathematics if you're interested, or just kind of, they're just beautiful to see. And, you know, they offer kind of like this nice porous material for cells to kind of interact with the environment, but also kind of be able to sort of transmit or transfer or um, filter out uh, nutrients. Um, and they're found, like I said, on most bacteria and almost all archaea, which is another domain of life that's related to bacteria. Um, so they're very, very essential for life. They're resistant to a lot of high in temperature and extreme pH. So some of these bacteria that I talk about or that people study grow in the equivalent of boiling battery acid. And that means that these proteins have to be resistant to that type of you know, extreme condition because they're completely on the outside exposed to all this environment. And if you actually um, look at some of the, the numbers, you know, prokaryotes, which are bacteria and archaea, they outnumber us by a lot. And so if all of them have this protein and they outnumber us, so this protein is probably the most dominant protein on the planet. And it's really fascinating that this could be potentially used as a biomaterial. So what can we do with this? And, and what do we do? Well, we can isolate them. We can study them on the cell. Um, we can kind of engineer them. But really what, we, um, what I do is kind of look at them at different length, length scales. And what that means is here I'm showing a particular bacterium called Colobacter crescentis, known for its crescent shape where on the surface of this bacterium, there's a surface layer protein. And you can see how it breaks down from uh, basically on the surface down to this sort of nice pinwheel pattern that's repeating down to the individual protein here on the right. 
And then that sort of is made up of these individual like atoms that are arranged together into this protein backbone. Um, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the harder things is to be able to understand how these different components or different scales are, are you know, are interplay with one another so that they can actually self-assemble and arrange themselves on a complete bacteria and keep going like this. And it's not an easy task. Um, you know, we have uh, in microscopes and things that can go down really small. We can have images that can kind of, in, uh, or microscopes that can image, you know, in between. But it's really hard to look at the whole sort of scale of these things. And, you know, luckily, uh, actually at the molecular foundry, we actually have a lot of different microscopes. And what that allows us to do is really be able to look at these systems um, at small to medium to large length scales. And so as an example with this system, you know, we can look at optical microscopes, uh, uh, microscope images of these proteins on live bacteria, which I'm showing on the left here um, from Colobacter crescentis. You can see like this brightly colored red outline for each cell where the protein itself has been tagged and directly observed using this microscope technique here called fluorescence microscopy. The cells are living, so you can observe them, you can see them grow, you can see them thrive. But if you wanna to get to higher, higher resolution and look at sort of more of the details of the actual protein, you can use a different type of microscope called an atomic force microscope, which we have in the same building, to look at the cells, which I'm showing here in the sort of orange and tan kind of color, and then be able to really go down to a few nanometers just to see the patterning on the cells. And the, these sort of techniques of being able to bridge these living scales are just, you know, just really um, essential for us because when we can engineer or make new materials or kind of study how they work, um, we're able to kind of look at how they assemble maybe very at the nanometer scale and then what that means structurally or biologically at the micrometer or even millimeter scale. So um, I'll conclude that, you know, that with, with that, with this slide where, you know, I kind of come back to this uh, what kind of inspired me to get into science. And again, it was just being able to, you know, communicate, being able to kind of like really, um, you know, understand complex, you know, the PC Cole being able to kind of tell me these really complex things. But overall, I think one, one thing is that I've always been happy as a scientist. That is, I found people, I found kind of communities, I found, um, you know, uh, areas where I wanted to be, study and kind of be goofy. Um, these are just kind of a couple snapshots of me and other people that I've worked with at the Molecular Foundry, me like the students and other postdocs, um, as well as other staff members, and really kind of having a nice community like that, having kind of mentorship um, was a really key aspect for me to develop as a scientist. So thank you very much and um, uh, take questions, I guess, later. Thank you, Dr. Rudd. Uh, and definitely, we already have some questions in the chat box. And so we'll have you join us back again. I'm going to have our next speaker turn on her video. Uh, Kezi Chang is currently an Activate uh, fellow here at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where our where scientists get an opportunity to take a idea from the laboratory and think about it in terms of bringing it out into uh, the public. And so uh, she's joining us and talking about not only her scientific journey, but this new transition and joining us as a, a fellow here at uh, Berkeley Lab. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and let you uh, share your screen and uh, we'll get started on your introduction before we get into questions. Great, thanks, Faith. Um... Let me just pull up my slides. Hi, everyone. My name is Kezi Chen. Um, I'm currently finishing my PhD at Harvard University, and I will be heading out to the Bay Area later this fall to be an Activate Fellow in Cyclotron Road. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys about my journey as a scientist and now a budding entrepreneur. So feel free to ask any questions if you have. So to start, um, and pretty, I traveled a little bit far to get here, I guess. So I, I grew up in, um, in a city in Qian, uh, in China, and it's a city known for its history. Um, so that's where the terracotta warriors are, and it used to be the capital of China. And um, so just lots of interesting things about the city. I love that city. I came to the US when I was nine years old, and um, I moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, so for anyone who knows about New York City, it's in the southmost point of New York City. And um, it was there that I started um, 
actually I learned English um, when I first came to the US. And so it was a big transition for me. And um, for high school, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which um, on the smiley face here, it's in the north part, northernmost part of New York City. So for the first two years of my high school experience, I was taking the train for four hours every day round trip um, to go to school, which was tough, but interesting because it allowed me to see a lot of just different people, different types of people in New York. And um, that was a really great experience for me. So after Bronx Science, I went to do my Bachelor of Science in Material Science and a minor in Management at MIT. Um, and I've been in Boston since then. Um, while I was at MIT, I did a lot of different experiences like um, this MIT Oxford exchange program where I got to do research for nine months uh, in England. And I also got to do some internships um, through the MIT International Office where I got to travel to Brazil to study the innovation ecosystem at a few of the different cities there. That was a really great experience for what I'm doing now. Um, after uh, getting my bachelor's, I went on to study um, for my PhD at Harvard. So this is where I am right now. And I've been doing this for the past five years. Um, and my, uh, the next step for me is really to go to activate and uh, go to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to start a company called Flow Materials, which I'll tell you a little bit more in detail uh, later on. But what led me to Lawrence Berkeley a year and a half ago was actually this research exchange program that I did. Um, so this research exchange program had about seven different schools around the country and allowed you to really go to a different university and interact with professors, interact with the staff, staff scientists um, and uh, present your research and also learn about what else you might be interested in. So around this time, I was, um, on the non-science side, I was working in hosting a symposium called the Harvard Circular Economy Symposium, which is something that I'm really passionate about. So reducing waste and turning a linear um, system into a more circular system. So taking waste back as resources to use. So both of these things really led me to start the journey of, um, of flow, of being part of flow and now being an Activate Fellow. So a little bit background on, I guess, yeah. So just going into my high school days, because I know a lot of people on this call um, are high school students. And my time at Bronx Science was really, really shaped my, my current experiences, I think. Um, the school is a specialized high school in New York City. So you take an exam to get into the school. And um, the school was really great for encouraging uh, students to, to explore sciences. And one of the first activity I did as a student there was join the uh, oceanography team. And this is a picture of us uh, after winning the Bay Scallop Bowl, um, which is like a regional competition um, where uh, with a team of four people, you're answering different kinds of questions about ocean and um, marine sciences and geology and you know everything in, in the ocean basically. And it was such a fun experience and it showed me how fun science could be. Um, so continue to encourage uh, everything else following that. Um, in high school, I was also very much involved in athletics. Um, I was on the basketball team and swim team and I thought it was a perfect combination to, you know, to kind of not just be the scientist, to also, to also have um, sports in your life and, and learn to be on a team and learn to work with a team. Um, so I learned a lot from that, ex those experiences. I also did the summer thing at West Point because I thought I wanted to potentially go into West Point. Um, I thought that was interesting, a different sort of program than the other schools I was applying to. They also had a great engineering program. So it appealed to me. Um, and in my last year of high school, I was part of this class. So the Intel science competition. So we had a class for that. And I, um, so we were supposed to all find a mentor for this uh, research project. 
and you're supposed to find a mentor and you're supposed to work almost like two summers on this research project. And for some reason, I could not find anyone to mentor me. So I like looked at every school in New York City. I emailed people at Columbia, I emailed people at NYU. Um, and I just had a lot of rejections because it was hard for a high school student to go out there and ask to be mentored on a research project. Um, but then I got lucky. So I got really lucky. So of you know over 50 emails I sent, I got a reply from one professor. And this professor was, uh, he was a professor in uh, quantum optics at um, Lehman College. And what was really great about Lehman College is that it was two blocks away from my high school. Um, so Bronx Science was like at the top right, Lehman was here and I lived three blocks away from the school. Um, and I was able to go swimming there after doing research. So everything just kind of miraculously worked out for me, even though I was having the hardest time finding anyone to mentor me. And Dr. Gary was an amazing mentor. I, I mean, he, he, when I found out that I was going to do a project on quantum optics, as a senior in high school with maybe like five months to the submission deadline for Intel, I, just, I did not think I could do anything with that. Um, I didn't think that I could learn quantum optics in such a short period of time. And I, I definitely didn't learn, uh, you know, too in depth, but I, I did learn what I needed to learn for this project. And he really helped me out. And the graduate students in his lab really, really supported me throughout that entire process. So. Um, three months into this project, we discover something new. And I, I was pretty surprised by that. Um, so I wrote up this project on field parity oscillations um, without photon exchange in, with Dr. Gary. And we wrote a paper on this. And um, I ended up submitting it to Intel and science competition and um, got semifinalists for those competitions. And um, I thought the coolest uh, actual competition was the one that President Obama actually got to attend while he was in New York. It was the New York Science and Engineering Fair. So definitely had some great experiences um, doing these science competitions and, and also doing a lot of other things during high school. Um, but finding the right mentor was definitely um, just, it was, the, it was a combination of luck and, you know, being rejected many times by many different people. So um, I would say be resilient if you're trying to find a project. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about, I was going back and thinking about how I got on the path I'm, I, I'm on and who inspired me along these paths. So I think the first, first real like interest in science was um, through my high school teacher, she was uh, she was a high school chemistry teacher, Miss Ramos, and she she was teaching us about atoms and how atoms interacted with each other. And one day, she presented um, the class with this thing called the Eisenberg uncertainty principle, and I was hooked. This was like my freshman year, I think, and I had, and the the abstraction of it all just made me more curious about how everything worked. Um, you know, the principle itself says that momentum and position cannot be determined at the same time. And I just didn't understand what that meant. So I, I, I really wanted to learn more. And I think this drove my interest in um, how atoms interact with each other. And this, this was the key part in, I think, my introductory course in material science is looking at this on the bottom left here, there's the material science tetrahedron where you look at the, it's basically it summarizes what material science is. And it's looking at how to optimize structure, processing, performance and properties at the same time, as well as reiterating and characterizing these properties and then designing new performance, designing new processing steps um, to get to a certain property. So it was like a lot of iterating um, around these different pillars um, that I found very, very interesting. And 
during my time in college, I got to work on several different um, projects. So I worked in uh, nanomaterials, which was a, for one of the first internships I did at MITRE. Um, and I was mentored by a great, uh, a great supervisor who, who, who actually taught me that communication was that just as important as um, the, science, the science you're doing. So being able to communicate what you're doing to people was really important. And that's something that was, I can't you know, speak more highly of now, um, now that I have to talk to people about what I do a lot. Um, but I also got to work with battery materials and supercapacitors. Um, and um, I did a lot of that research at Oxford uh, and I found it to be very interesting. Um, and, but my, my PhD work on the bottom right here um, is actually based on materials optimization for photoelectric tunable actuators. And what that means um, is um, so an actuator is a material that deforms under some sort of stimulus. So in this diagram here, um, we have a, what's known as a dielectric elastomer. So you have an elastomer sandwiched between two compliant electrodes. And when you apply a voltage to this material, you can actually induce a change in the shape of the material. So you would actually compress um, compress the material and then it would expand laterally. So you can use this to start making flexible electronics or wearable devices that um, that's able to generate mechanical energy from electrical stimulus. So I started working on this project because I, I just found it to be really interesting because I was interested both in the material, an elastomer, which is um, made of a, a polymer, um, as well as the electronic side of it, um, which in this case, we, we use a lot of carbon nanotubes for that. So I have two videos of some of the work that I've done um, during my PhD. And on the left here is um, a video of a tunable window so this is actually um, a, so a dielectric elastomer on top of a, a piece of glass with, um, and this glass has ITO on it, so it's a conductive material. And then on the other side of the elastomer, we have carbon nanotubes. So both ITO and carbon nanotubes are relatively transparent. Um, when we apply voltage to this, uh, we can scatter light on the surface of the material. So we actually worked to patent this um, particular uh, technology because uh, it works, yeah, it works really well as a tunable blind. And on the right here, it's, it's something that I've been working on more recently. Um, and it's looking at an elastomer system. So it's a, another polymer network. It's a polymer network that is able to undergo reversible bonding. Um, so, so reversible covalent bonding. And what happens is instead of being induced by electric, um, by electric field, when I turn on the UV light here, you can actually um, get the elastomer to break its bond. Um, so the, the network bonding breaks under, under light. And then when you turn the light off, the bonds reform. So we're able to control um, things like self-healing of elastomers to um, freezing the material in space, for example, um, to uh, patterning different surfaces because the elastomer is able to flow like a liquid under light and then behave like a solid when the light is turned off. So a lot of this work has led me to flow materials, which I can tell you about more now. Um, so one of the problems that I, that really meant a lot to me was plastic waste. So as you, I, I don't know if you've heard of this, but by, I think in, in by 2050, you know, there's gonna be more plastics in the ocean than fish by mass. And that's, that was a really scary thought to me. And I knew that I was working a lot on materials like polymers and polymers are used to make plastic. So I really wanted to see how can I, how can I work to, be responsible for the materials that I put out into the world. Um, and that means looking at the end of life of these materials. 
Um, and most materials, most polymers and plastics fall into two categories. They're either linear thermoplastic materials, so the things that you can throw into the blue bin, or they're network polymer materials, and these are called thermal sets. So they're cross-linked, and once they're cross-linked, they can't uh, re really be remelted or broken down to be reprocessed. A lot of the thermal set materials currently go to waste. Another problem in plastics is that a lot of the materials get downcycled, so they lose their um, mechanical performance after you recycle it once or twice. So there's only a limited number of um, useful life of most plastics. And a third problem in polymers is that um, a lot of the materials become very cheap after they get recycled. So there really isn't a huge economic incentive to recycle them, and which is why we're dealing with such bad plastic problems now. Um, and what Flow Materials, which is a startup that I'm part of, is trying to do is to work on a new chemistry. So we're, we're commercializing a new material platform called PDKs to, and what's special about these materials is that you can bond them and you can debond them um, under certain conditions. So we're, we're making monomer materials and building polymer networks through these monomers. And two of the monomers are able to click together and unclick. Um, so it's a, it's a, a exothermic, which means it's a very uh, uh, downhill reaction to make these materials. And then when we put these uh, plastics in, it, in an acid bath, um, we can extract the, the uh, initial monomers or the initial building blocks of the material back. Um, and in the process, we're able to remove additives and we're able to remove colorants and a lot of different um, impurities that go into the plastics that makes it currently hard to recycle. So we can get that material back and then we're able to remake uh, new materials with that without any of the monomers going to waste. Um, so that's what Flow Materials is trying to do. But at the same time, we're also trying to understand how can we, um, how can we build a business around this technology? You know, it, it, interesting science does not always lead to uh, profitable businesses. And what we're hoping to do is to be the material supplier as well as the material recycler so that we're responsible for all of the material that goes through the company um, that we make and produce. And I am currently learning to be a science entrepreneur. And it's a really, really exciting uh, experience. And it's also something that I haven't done before. So it's a lot of new challenges. Um, I'm really grateful for my co-founder, Peter, who is also a chemist PhD. So he has a very great technical background and we have very complementary scientific knowledge. Um, and we also have the same passion for reducing waste. Um, during this process, we, we formed the company, we are um, trying to license uh, the technology, the IP from Lawrence Berkeley, we participated in several incubators pitching to investors and other stakeholders, trying to learn about the supply chain of um, the market that we're trying to go after and recently was accepted as Activate Fellows, which is, is an awesome program for deep tech because a lot of hard tech Technologies require a lot of um, upfront capital to support um, the development and de-risking of the technology and Activate really provides us with the resource and the funding and the place um, to do that within Berkeley National Lab. So, so I'm super excited. And I guess some lessons I've learned along the way is, um, and I, I'm happy to talk about any of these, but I think that imposter syndrome reveals itself in many different ways. Um, I faced lots of imposter syndrome at all of these different places I've been to and um, programs that I've been a part of and, um, you know, in, in applying for things. And, and I, my advice here is just to be confident in your abilities, but also be open to asking for help at every step of the way, because they're really great people who will, ask, who will give you help if you just ask for it. Um, definitely be persistent, resilient, and dynamic in the face of challenges because there will be lots of challenges. Um, and it's, it's hard, but it's, it's worth it. 
I think it's really important to enable those people around you and form a good team because that team is what pushes you to go further and lifts you up when you're having a really hard time. I think also it's really important to make lasting connections with people. And that means traveling and experiencing new things and being inspired by the people around you. And uh, my suggestion, so I've done a lot of different things in sciences, but also outside of sciences. And I find that you'll really be confident in what you want to do when you know what you don't want to do. So it's okay to take as many internships as you want to figure out what it is that you actually want to do um, when you're ready to pursue that. Um, and when you are looking for what that thing to do is, I would recommend to be guided by what you love, what you care about, what you're good at, and what the society needs. And, um, and all of these things come together to, to really help you figure out what you want to do with your career. Um, and then finally, just find joy in learning and making it fun. So that's, that's my... Great. Thank you, Kezi, for sharing that with us and giving us such a great talk. And we've already had some questions in the chat box that we'll get to. I'd like Dr. Rad to uh, turn his video on as well and join us again uh, to get uh, back to our questions. And they uh, are coming in, so I greatly appreciate them. And I'm going to go to Dr. Rad to ask the first question that was in the chat box of uh, bacteria likes to make a lot, lo likes to make lots of proteins. How? That was someone's first question from your observations about proteins and um, your work earlier. Sure, yeah. So, you no, know, proteins, um, they kind of are the workhorse of biology. Um, so in your cells, they do everything, right? They're metabolizing, they form the structural basis of um, your cell, they go on the outside, they, they transport materials inside and outside of cells, they communicate with other cells, um, they allow for cells to adhere. So it's pretty much the workhorse and, you know, the central kind of like, you know, theory in biology is that you have DNA, which is the encodable information that is taken to translate into proteins eventually into mRNA and then that's uh, read out transcribed into proteins. And so that sort of is roughly the process of life at the molecular level. And, you know, these uh, bacteria, they're no different from our cells. They, be, they just need to produce and survive and to do so they make a lot of proteins and it just happens that S layers are a key thing that they have to make to protect themselves, and they just make a lot of it. Um, and just for context, you know, it's, it's amazing because it, back of the envelope calculations, just to cover their own cells each time, and the bacteria divide about every 20 minutes, that is one cell becomes two, every 20 to 30 minutes, they'll need to make about 500 copies of this protein per second. So they're just completely, ch really churning this thing out um, and sending it out to the surface so that they can completely coat themselves in, in this armor so they can protect themselves. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I, I think people are getting a really good lecture today, both in material science and in proteins and bacteria. Um, there is one quick travel question for you, Kezi, uh, of um, where in Brazil uh, was the university that you visited and which ones we had somebody on the line um, that's from Brazil. So we wanted to know. Yeah, I was in Sao Paulo um, and Florianopolis. So I, I got to visit the University of Sao Paulo and um, also work with people in, uh, I think it's the Santa Cantarina um, University, so. Awesome. And going back to you, um, you had the video of, and you talked about the polymers breaking down. So um, one person said, uh, if it behaves like a solid while the light is off, then it can or can't reform. Um, also, isn't that how a vaporizer might work? I'm not sure about the vaporizer part, but I can talk a little bit more about um, the solid and liquid um, when the light is on and off. So um, basically the light allows radicals to be generated in the system. And these radicals are able to cleave bonds that breaks the bond. And what that does is that you're actually breaking apart the network that makes it a solid material. So at certain compositions, and if you optimize the composition of the materials you have in your system, um, you can transition, you can go from this uh, sold to gel phase transition. Um, and once you turn the light on, you, can, you allow the material to flow again. And if you have, for example, a cut in your material, the material can actually flow back and heal itself. Um, 
so you're you're actually able to reform this many many times so we've done this hundreds of cycles and shown that it works so um and then i think for the monomers attaching and detaching for for the for flow materials and the, the materials that we're trying to make for uh, for the startup, um, this is actually infinitely recyclable material. So um, there's no, uh, there's nothing lost in reforming and um, remaking the bonds every time. Awesome, that's great to hear that the, the mechanical capabilities won't de uh, like go down after the recycling. And so one other person said, how do you plan to recycle? Um, them as well. How do you plan to, I think, mint the polymers that you're making? Yeah. Are you planning to, I guess, recycle them at any point? Yeah, so um, so a lot of the current thermoplastics are recycled through mechanical um, degradation. So uh, you basically shred them and then you can melt them and then you can make new materials from them. So we are looking at taking a plastic, putting it into an acid bath and then recovering and separating out the monomers again so that we can remake new, new polymers and new plastics that way. And Basad, going back to you, um, how do you come up with new ideas? So, you know, heard Kezi talk about wanting to think about, you know, plastics in the ocean and, and it, coming up with a new material to solve for that um, detrimental uh, detrimental uh, uh, environmental uh, global crisis. So um, how do you think about or what is your motivation for um, coming up with the new materials that you're developing, especially at the molecular foundry um, here at Berkeley Lab? Yeah, so I really think about it as maybe two different ways. One is bio-inspired and the other is interdisciplinary science. So bio-inspired, you know, biology does a lot of stuff, like, right, we have bacteria growing in low pH, we have them growing at extreme temperatures, we have them kind of filtering food, making energy, you know, harvesting light. And so that, you know, has been a lot of uh, the impetus for materials research a lot of times, because you're looking at this and saying, wow, they can do this very efficiently, you know, they can convert energy, and how come we can't do that? And how can we, you know, harness this technology or harness their ability to do that and make new materials. And that either springs, you know, using biological molecules like proteins to do it, or, you know, chemists get inspired and use kind of chemistry to make sort of maybe photo, like photo reaction centers to mimic photosynthesis and do that type of energy conversion. Um, and then the other part is, like I said, is interdisciplinary science. So um, at the Molecular Foundry and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we're kind of part of a whole like team science of like a lot of different researchers. So we have, you know, people who are chemists, physicists, who are in, in, into energy technologies, um, material scientists, you know, engineers, physicists, theoretical physicists. And so when you kind of put a bunch of people like that together in one building or many buildings, um, you kind of have these conversations, sometimes just over lunch or something where they're looking for some new material to do this, has this property, or they have, you know, some need for some device. And, you know, they look to you and they say, oh, well, maybe we could try this. And so there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, just sort of, just sort of like, you know, talking over a, a lunch or a beer or something and just saying, hey, let's try this experiment. And, you know, it turns out sometimes you can kind of get a lot of great science to work um, by just having people that have different expertise and have different backgrounds and have different um, worldviews and then coming together and saying, well, let's try your thing and let's try my uh, material and see what happens. And um, a lot of that um, happens because you have so many different like researchers around you here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Thank you for that. And you both talked about how you had uh, certain people who influenced your career trajectory. So can you point pinpoint to uh, either an experience or a person um, that maybe pushed you into the material science space? So, you know, even more than um, thinking about just STEM in general or helping out with the internship, uh, material science is is similar to data science, kind of a newer field. We're used to chemistry, physics, biology. We're not used to hearing more so about material science. So how did you start to come up with, you know, I think material science is the pathway in order to do the things that I wanna do in the future. Um, Kizzy, if you wanna start off with that question. Yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned data science because I was, I was also quite interested in that. I think, similar to data science, which is combining mathematics and statistics and real world problems, 
um, into a field. Material science really combines physics, chemistry, biology, and a lot of different, you know, like basic sciences. And that's what that's exactly the reason that made me want to do material science is because I could do, I could like, you know, connect these different fields of sciences and um, and invent new new things. Like it, it's a great, I think it's a it's a wonderful um, science for invention um, because it allows you to have your feet in a lot of different uh, uh, understanding a lot of different other sciences. Um, I think in my personal experience, actually, I, I was a TF for a class called science and cooking, and it was actually a material science class. Um, and this class was really wonderful because it bridged, it bridged material science with cooking and what the class, this class was structured in a way where, you know, a chef would come in and cook this amazing meal, amazing dish that, um, it, that looks really nice and has this really, it's just really cool. But then you'd kind of go into uh, a, a science lecture about viscosity or a science lecture about elasticity or a science lecture about heat transfer. And then you'd put that together. You'd put, you, you'd actually go and make pancakes with different elastic modulus by putting a different amount of gluten in it. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And it was actually a material science class disguised as a, science, as a cooking class. Um, so I think, yeah, I think material science is just in everything around us. Um, it dates back as early as, you know, making porcelain um, and metallurgy, uh, now into making batteries and electric vehicles and recycling and polymers and biomaterials and um, artificial muscles. So yeah, it's, it's a very, very like interesting and fun field. <laughs> Thank you for that. And in the chat box, I, I might be able to put the link for the edX course for the science of cooking class in there. So I'll put that in for the audience. Um, beside, if you want to answer the question about how did you navigate into, you know, material science and thinking about, again, new materials from this interdisciplinary um, space. So I kind of came into material science probably later in my scientific career. Um, you know, early on when I was interested in biological materials and molecules, it was really in the context of health and human disease. So I was studying them to understand, you know, how processes work in the cell and then how they could go awry, let's say in cancers or in other diseases that are found in humans. And so that's sort of a lot of guiding, you know, uh, uh, research, especially with the National Institute of Health or, uh, you know, major campuses. So in, that, in those departments, I was really interested in, in kind of understanding how these proteins work together or how these molecules work together um, inside the cell. And then when I came to Berkeley Lab, um, you know, it was sort of uh, to study these systems. And I'd sort of, you know, started to understand them by talking to other scientists that no, no, you can't, you know, these are just not, you know, kind of uh, isolated systems that are related to health. They could be used for other materials. And so when you think about, you know, um, things that are like in real life, so I guess now nanosensors are a big, or sorry, DNA sequencers are a big uh, deal and those use proteins in them. Um, you can use, um, you know, like novel materials to great to create like these hydrogels, which are expandable or like decreased um, kind of systems using kind of glass and like polymers, which are from bio biology. Um, you can actually use like the living cells themselves to sort of spray and coat um, materials to like maybe replenish cements or other things because they can actually calcify or take um, carbonate and make, make it into calcium carbonate, uh, sort of calcium to calcium carbonate. And recreate like cements and plasters and things like that, in, you know, in, in, um, without really too much input. Um, that's where I started to get really interested in, in, in material science because I started to realize the same systems I was looking at, maybe just you know, in earlier in my career, um, are kind of really useful in this other aspect of, of, of development and technology. And you know, I think this is kind of a burgeoning field right now. Um, I think that the two are coming, you know, in terms of the different fields are coming together: biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, physics to kind of understand and, and develop um, new, new materials. And, and it's really hard because a lot of, and especially when I started in this field, I was very, you know, my head hurt quite a bit because you're having to learn a whole new language. You're having to learn a whole new set of, you know, design rules and other kind of um, interests and in how people kind of really view systems and how to study them. And then they, conversely, they don't know much about biology sometimes too. So you're trying to kind of bridge this gap 
and um, teach them as well. So it's a very, um, you know, it was very interesting, I think, later in my career to have that sort of switch. And it kind of goes to, you know, the, this, this concept that I always have about being a scientist, which is you're always learning, right? I mean, you could imagine, you know, you're done with your PhD, like, that's it, right? Like, you're, you've, that you've, you've filled your mind, that's it. <laughs> There's no more space for anything else. But I'm constantly learning um, kind of new things. And even kind of in my current career, um, I find myself always opening a textbook or going to some sort of new articles and research research articles or summaries or um, reviews to sort of learn about a new field that I hadn't really thought about before. Awesome. And I think that team science comes back into even supporting Activate fellows who are coming here, you know, and starting to think about their, you know, transition from or being a scientist entrepreneur, so hyphenated new title. Um, so, uh, Kezi, do you have an idea of who you might want to seek out when you get to Berkeley Lab and some specific people or spaces that um, you might want to work with with scientists who are here full time? Uh, like the side who um, have the expertise of being at the molecular foundry or an FIAT flight source. Um, are there some specific people that you've thought about working with or specific areas that you've thought about? Um, yeah, there is a lot of research and development that we still have to do. Uh, it's just the very start of the, of the journey with flow materials. Um, I think Activate provides us the, the time to really de-risk the technology and there's really no better place to do it than at the National Lab. There's such, the National Lab fosters such a um, collaborative environment to support science and to support scientists to do new research. And for example, we're, we're thinking of working with ADPDU to, for monomer um, production, we're looking at uh, using, you know, equipment and sharing equipment with current Activate fellows, as well as uh, different staff scientists at the lab to uh, characterize the behavior of our materials and also with experts who might know a lot more in recycling than we do. So there, there's a lot of um, opportunities for collaboration and I'm, I'm definitely going to be <laughs> reaching out and sending lots of emails out and seeing who replies. It's, it's the same thing, like, it's the same thing as back in high school, you know, you just, yeah. So. Hopefully you have a higher return rate on emails uh, <laughs> when you're here at the lab. And one student said, do you see a future link between the electromechanical elastomer assistance and nanotechnology applications? And this might actually beside the, you know, any nano nanotechnology applications in what you're doing as well, um, because you are at the molecular foundry, which does specialize in nanoscience. Yeah, I'm actually not really well versed on uh, elastomer systems, so I think as you would definitely answer that. But you know, for for now, the technology, right? I mean, this is you know, since the late 2000s when the sort of national nano uh, science initiative was passed in Congress, and that was sort of the goal of the foundry and other NSRCs was to kind of look, study, and um, identify nano, uh, nano uh, you know, nanomaterials for like new applications. And so I think one of the you know. Uh, one, one good example that Berkeley Lab has always put out is that these quantum dots, right? These small nanoparticles that are fluorescent. And now you can go to any, um, you know, Best Buy or Costco and see these QLED TVs, which are just filled with those quantum dots because they emit light in such narrow wavelengths. And that was a property of the nanoscale. That is, you had these materials that were emitting light, but then you had to really make them tiny to make them emit light in very specific wavelengths. And that's how um, they worked. And, you know, um, you know the, the but you know, I'll make a pitch for bio, biology or biomaterials is we have this quote, um, I'm not sure who it's really attributed to, but you know, we always say biology is nanoscience that works. And I think that's because you know, everything on, in the biological scale is very small. It's always like very you know, sub hundred nanometers and things work around and they do things very efficiently. And I think you know, if at the bench we can get to that, that would be like the goal, right? To be able to really manipulate things at the very, very small scale. Um, but, um, and you know, the last pitch I'll make for the foundry is that, you know, we do have a lot of companies that come through here as well to, to um, you know, take, it, take advantage of our expertise and develop new nanotechnology. So we recently had a startup come through that was developing protein memetics for um, uh, cryopreservation of organs. And that was a big deal because now they can preserve organs uh, for a long, long time to allow them to be transported. And that was because they use nanoscale properties um, of, peptoids or protein memetics to be able to kind of design new molecules that could uh, keep a heart 
or keep a lung or keep other organs frozen without completely just rupturing inside with ice and things like that. That would be really common. Yeah, I would second that. I think there is a lot of um, there is an intersection between um, nanoscience or biomimicry as well as electromechanical actuators and biomimicry. So I can see a lot of overlap in these two areas. Thank you for that. And I'm going to end with our final question of the session, which we usually do is, what advice would you give yourself as a high school student or someone who's just starting off college? If you could go back and remember where you were when you were going off um, to college, what advice would you give yourself to avoid a few pitfalls? Um, so Kezi, since you're unmuted, I'll, I'll let you go first. Um, avoiding pitfalls. Oh, you want to take that first? I need to think about it for a second. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can avoid pitfalls, but I think what you can do is kind of make sure you're in a place that you're happy to be, you know, and I think that, you know, the times in my life where I've been really just gung ho about what I'm doing in scientific work, you know, I've just been in a good place where you have great people to work with, you, they're fun, they're, you know, smart and they tell you, they work with you, they're, you know, collaborative. They also serve as mentors so they can kind of give you guidance when you're kind of having trouble. So you're always going to hit a pitfall, but just, you know, make sure you're kind of in a place or doing something that you love because, you know, when you kind of, ch challenges will always come in no matter what you do. But I think part of the fun is keeping at it and then being there for the long term and then having to overcome those challenges, whether it's a scientific issue, it's in your personal life, you know, those are kind of what I've sort of wish I could tell myself when I was younger, like don't fret the small things, you know, or you know, you'll you'll be fine. Yeah, um, I think for me is I would surround myself with good people who push you and support you, and and then also think of someone who you look up to, um, who are, who's not too you know too much older than you, and just go ask them to be your mentor and ask them to give you advice. And I'm sure a lot of those people would be happy to do that because um, good people like to surround themselves with good people. Awesome. So thank you so much to our panelists today for helping us finish up our career series on a very strong point and with this great lecture and, and thought into nanoscience and material science. Um, we really, really appreciate you being a part of our series. Um, and to everybody who has stuck with us, thank you for attending, asking great questions. As uh, we stated at the beginning, you can find all of these uh, links to the recordings on our website. Um, and that's k12education.lbl.gov that you can look for that and more programming that we'll have. Um, so have a great weekend, everybody. And thank you, uh, Kenzie, and thank you, Gazad, for uh, joining us.